This is not just a Taria Vaza workshop. It's a masterclass in writing poetry. Joshua Gage, one of Luna's pets at Cuttlefish Books, promise it will make sense at the end, joins us today to talk Taria Vaza. Yes, we've looked at Taria Vaza before. Keith Everts came along last year, but you know, Japanese aesthetics can be hard. I find them hard, but today we're aspiring to greatness and learning more about Taria Vaza and more importantly, having fun. My name is Patricia and this is the Poetry P podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts and YouTube. And speaking of which, if you want to see Joshua in all his glory, this presentation will be on our YouTube channel. When we studied Taria Vaza together before, there was a lot of feedback. Mostly you told me that it was hard, but you enjoyed trying it. And so when Joshua offered to present another look at Taria Vaza, I bit his hand off, metaphorically speaking. But before we get into Joshua's presentation, which is full of zest and gusto, a few bits of housekeeping. I'm not saying there's a flash coup coming up, but if there were, and you're not on the mailing list, you're going to miss it. So make sure you're signed up. Please leave the podcast a review. Five star would be nice wherever you get your podcasts. And if that place is YouTube, you won't be able to leave a review, but you can make a comment with a nice review in the comment section. This will help make us some new haiku friends. More people will find us. And if you could, please consider purchasing a membership or giving the podcast a donation. Both can be done via our Buy Me A Coffee page. And there's also a PayPal donation button on our website. There are benefits to you in membership. So thank you if you can. Right, I've got my cup of tea ready. What about you? Let's go. We're off to Cleveland in the US to visit with Joshua Gage. Howdy and hello from Cleveland to all you haiku readers, writers and students. So today we're going to discuss Tori Wase. Tori Wase is an important topic, one that's been part of haiku since the 17th century, so it's important to understand. However, due to linguistic differences and the lack of a one-to-one -one direct translation, things get a little bit muddied. So I'm approaching this through a lens of enhancement and contrast. All right, here's the game plan, poets. I'm going to walk you through a little bit of haiku and haiku history to understand how Tori Iwase comes into haiku and how it works in classic haiku. Then, I know the last time I was on here, I was told that we needed more examples. So we'll explore some classic and modern examples, using both to develop a few prompts. Then I'll put together a few more prompts for you. After that, you're right, and Patricia will be overwhelmed with the flood of haiku, create a perfect issue of Poetry P that brings about universal harmony and world peace. Those are the goals, and we hope you come along for the journey. Okay, so the cat who brought about Tori Iwase to haiku was this poet named Tosei. He took the name from the Chinese poet Li Bua, who he really admired. Please understand that at this time, Chinese poetry, especially Tang Dynasty, was prized, studied, and imitated by Japanese poets. So, Li Bua means white plum, and Tosei means green peach. So this poet, Tosei, gets a job while he's young at Ueno Castle, working for the local lord's son. In doing so, he studies literature and writing, and when his master dies, he moves and dedicates his life to poetry. He moves to Edo, where he starts working on poetry under the tutelage of the poet Keegan. He's really good. He's published, he's reading, leading Renku session, he's young and in his 30s and becoming known as a poet. However, he was slowly becoming disillusioned in the poetry world. 
At Edo this time, poetry masters would compete for disciples, and there was a lot of money and prestige. In 1680, he moves across the river from Nihonbashi to the Fukugawa area, which is seen as a loss uh, or defeat by poets of this age, but is seen as kind of poetic independence and vanguard uh, by his disciples. They set him up with a place to live, and one even buys him a banana tree. He changes his name from Tosei to the Japanese for banana tree, Basho. This has been, he begins to uh, develop his own style of haiku and incorporate elements of Toriyawase. So here's the poem from 1680 that started this new school of thought regarding poetry. And this is how Toriyawase gets introduced into haiku. On a bare branch, the crow has settled. Autumn evening. On a bare branch, the crow has settled autumn evening. Here's how this poem is working. Note that nothing is actually occurring in this poem. The branch exists, the crow exists. It is evening. At the very best, in certain translations, you might argue that the crow is still in the middle of adjusting itself or settling, but even then, everything still could be completely still and serene in this poem. What makes this poem work is that Basho takes the Kigo, autumn evening, and builds off the emotional impact of that image or mood by enhancing it with other images. In this case, though it, those images are a bare branch and the crow. Note how, while they're all different things, they all enhance the emotional impact of the poem and the mood of the poem by enhancing the Kigo and its emotional impact. In doing so, Basho has made the emotional impact of the Kigo even more palpable simply by choosing the right elements that are different enough to catch the reader's attention, but work together to enhance the mood. Uh, this is important because it's these two ideas working together and uh, juxtaposition that create Tori Awase in haiku. H.G. Henderson, uh, famous for the Henderson Award uh, issued by the Haiku Society of America, argues that there is a principle of internal comparison in haiku and that differences are just as important as likenesses. Chapter four of Haruo Shirani's book about Basho is, uh, is titled Juxtaposition, Cutting and Joining. Susumu Takaguchi argues that too many people have focused on the contrast aspect of the term juxtaposition due to uh, juxtaposition misinter being misinterpreted solely as contrast and urges poets to aim towards the harmonious effect of the term more. Takaguchi argues that awase, in tori awase, means putting things together for congruous harmony, and cautions against slapping two images together for contrast or juxtaposition because they don't always work together. The two disparate images need to work with each other as much as they do against each other. They have to be related for a wide uh, ranging reasons, but they do have something working in harmony that can enhance the emotional effect of the poem. Let's look at how Tori Awase works in other Japanese arts. A tea ceremony is an excellent example. This is coffee, by the way, not tea, but you know, it serves the same purpose. Uh, uh, in the 16th century, Rikyu codified the tea ceremony, advocating for austerity and simplicity. Most tea ceremonies follow a basic formula, but each one is unique to the event and the experience simply because of Tori Awase. All the elements that a guest would see at a tea ceremony will be the same. The whisk, the container for the tea, the teapot, the heating elements, the tea mug, 
all of these elements are going to be the same. However, at every ceremony, you will see the same uh, uh, elements with the same procedure. This predates Basho, and Basho would have known all of this, and it would have been a known part of society at this time. However, each tea ceremony will be completely unique because the tea master will choose things specific for that event. All the elements presented will be considered in relationship to each other and how they look and appear to the guest. Colors, textures, and mediums of implements and decorations will be considered, but also things like season and location. Um, for example, in winter, a thicker tea bowl with a curved mouth will preserve the heat of the tea, whereas in the summer, a flatter opened mouth teacup is better. Everything is chosen to heighten the single uh, soul experience for the guest, enhancing the experience entirely. Even if they seem to contrast, all the elements chosen will work together to enhance and deepen the experience for the guest. So therefore in haiku, all the elements chosen will work together to enhance and deepen the experience for the reader. All right, 10th slide, party time, time to drink. This is a haiku party and we are playing a haiku drinking game. I have whipped up this uh, poetry pea punch recipe specifically for poetry pea and this presentation. Here's what I want folks to do. Take a few minutes, run to the kitchen or the liquor cabinet, grab all the ingredients, whip up a picture of this punch and pour a glass. So go do that while I explain the rules of the game. You can pause the video if you have to. You're going to have a drink in front of you. Every time somebody says the word haiku or toriwase, from this point forward, you take a sip. It's supposed to be a good one, too, uh, like a one ounce or two ounce sips, like a shot. None of this fussy pussy pinky up sipping. This isn't like communion wine. This is for fun. We're here to write haiku and have a fun time. So in the name of toriwase, this is haiku punch. Oh, that's two. There's one. There's two. All right, this is still coffee. But, you know, you get, uh, you know, that's two we have to go. Catch up, poets. So, while drinking and drink who are fun, let's look at how this punch actually works in terms of Toriawase. If the core ingredient is the whiskey, then everything should serve to enhance the whiskey. The whiskey flavor profile is sweet with hints of vanilla and caramel, but the rye makes it a little spicy, almost with hints of black pepper and clove. It's also a drier whiskey on the tongue. So if we take orange sake, we're adding a complementary but contrasting citrus flavor to the spice and the whiskey, but we're also adding sweetness and dryness from the sake itself. The orange juice and simple syrup heighten the sweetness and citrus flavors, while the bitters enhance the, the spiciness of the whiskey. Everything in this recipe builds to a very sweet, citrusy beverage, but the underlying core beverage is the whiskey profile, of course, and that's the main ingredient enhanced. Almost in, in the same way, Images enhanced are, in, are, are enhanced in haiku by each other, and with toriwase, often the kigo is enhanced by other hi, uh, images within the haiku. Here are a few things to consider before we look at more examples and some prompts. First, focus on things that are different, but enhance each other. The idea is to focus less on contrast and more on enhancing the emotional effect for the reader. If the elements are different enough, just assume the contrast will come through organically. Also, focus on the emotional impact of the Kigo 
and consider that as a vertical access or depth. Finally, consider synesthesia and how different types of images enhance each other. So let's re-examine this poem. If autumn evening implies the end of something, the end of the day, the visible change from a vibrant summer to an austere winter, and so forth, then there's a hint of quiet solitude, possibly even a contemplative aspect to this Kigo, but not ominousness or dread. It's important to consider connotation here with the language too, and the choices the translator has made. Bear uh, simply means sparse or leafless. It's not a dead branch, nor withered, just bare. Uh, each of these words, though accurate for translation, carries a specific connotation or associated meaning. When put into combination with other words, like the crow, uh, these connotations can also enhance the poem, so word choice and slight variations in synonyms can affect the tone of this poem. Here, the lone crow, the bare branch, create a quiet, contemplative, and possibly lonely moment that enhances the mood of the Kigo autumn evening. Taking this as an example, let's start with the Kigo and then enhance it. Start with the Kigo, and if we follow Basho's example, something that's a time of day. So again, autumn evening, think about things like spring morning, so on and so forth. Then choose a noun or two, and then an adjective to describe one of those nouns that enhances the mood of the Kigo. There we go. Uh, following this basic shell, in the same way that one follows the basic tools and formula of a tea ceremony, one can see how the words chosen enhance the Kigo. Let's pause this, take a few moments, and go ahead and practice. All right, great practice. Let's look at another example with a totally different emotional arc. In this poem, most uh, experts argue that Basho is aiming for Kurumi or lightness. Now, when we talk about Kurumi or lightness in haiku, there is an element of humor, but we're also discussing a lack of artifice or heaviness. Kurumi is like a chilled Pinot Grigio compared with a warm or room temperature aged Chianti. Kurumi is a light salad for lunch as opposed to a porterhouse steak with all the fixings. Kurumi is simple, and in its simplicity, it leaves room for interpretation. A heavier haiku might only have one takeaway or one meaning, whereas a haiku that exudes Kurumi opens more possibilities through its delicacy. Among the tree roots, soup and fish salad and cherry blossoms. This is what's happening here. Basha was at a cherry blossom viewing. They're going to do a renku, and this is the starting verse. This is the scene. There's a group of folks sitting underneath a cherry tree. They have this simple soup, a simple pickled vegetable salad, almost like a coleslaw with raw or pickled fish. Then they look up and are simply caught in the awe of this mantle of cherry blossoms over them. Some interpreters argue that there's a breeze or like a wind uh, and cherry blossoms are scattered over the poets. And others argue that they're just like looking up and uh, there's the blossoms. Either way, the Kiko of the blossoms, their lightness, their impermanence is enhanced by the simple picnic of delicate soup and a cold vegetable salad with fish. Tapping into the emotional depth or vertical access of the Kigo, Basho enhances um, the Kigo with the light picnic food, creating a very delicate yet resonant haiku. 
the whole point of Tori Awase is that all these elements work together uh, to create a mood for the reader. The sight and smell of the cherry blossoms, as well as their lightness and impermanence, are enhanced and enriched by the texture and location of the tree roots and the lightness and the taste and texture of the soup and salad at the picnic. Uh, in poetic terms, the visual and olfactory imagery of the Kigo is enhanced by the tactile images of the tree and the gustatory images in the food, creating a synesthetic experience for the reader that enhances a light poetic mood. But that's a lot of academic pretentiousness. So let's take a look at how we use this seed to grow our own haiku. Once again, let's start with the Kigo and then enhance it. Start with the Kigo. And if we follow Basho's example, let's pick a Kigo that's spread out or covers a large area. Uh, think about fog, weather conditions like that, anything that could be spread or dispersed. All right, so we've got our Kigo. Cherry blossoms are either spread over the group or alternately they are falling and scattered over the group or they're spread over above, anything like that. We're looking for a Kigo that's kind of everywhere all at once. All right like a tree's worth of blossoms or a carpet's worth of blossom that's scattering over. Then choose two or three images from that same scene that tap into different senses in the body, like the food, but that enhance the mood in the Kigo. Using this basic shell, one can see how different images that appeal to different senses enhance the Kigo. The differences between the images, like the difference between the picnic food and the cherry blossoms, is clear. They appeal to different senses in the body and are different types of objects. The contrast in part of Koryawase is clearly there. However, if we practice finding things that all create the same emotional mood, even in their differences, we can create a synesthetic combination of images that create Tori Awase in a haiku. Uh, I want to look at a couple contemporary examples now and create a couple shells from them as well. Here's a great example from the uh, July 21st issue of the Asahi Shimbun uh, by J.L. Huffman. If you explore the first two lines, the two foods, and I wanted to look at foods again, in combination already create a good emotion, especially when the third implied food in line two. Note the emphasis is on the visual stain, not the mustard itself. However, all of these only create a mood, but we have no Kigo upon which to hang that emotion. We need the vertical depth of the Kigo, which Huffman provides beautifully with spring training. Now, we have a very specific season, a time period, location, even weather. All of this is enhanced by the celebratory nature of the chosen food. Everything enhances the joy, the overwhelming possibility of a new baseball season and spring, new players with a new team, and the fact that we might finally, finally break the curse of Rocky Calvito. That could just be us on Lake Erie, though. Either way, again, let's use a seed. In this case, we're going to take a Kigo that's a very specific seasonal event. And let's compose a haiku around the emotions of that Kigo by building a scene of accompanying images. The easiest way to do this is to start with your Kigo and then list three or four images for each sense. Sight, sound, taste, touch, smell, related to the event. Food is great. Again, with food, you have both taste and smell uh, and possibly touch or texture on the tongue. But other images of emotion work too. 
find the two or three that really exemplify the emotional impact of the event and build a haiku from there. Here's another haiku by Aaron Castaldi. Obviously, the last of summer is the Kigo, but it's been worked into the phrase. While this could read like a list effect poem, it's not, and the verb has been carefully chosen to emphasize and enhance the Kigo. The cows are not simply swatting, they're swatting away or they're swatting at the last of summer. Swat is such an evocative word here as it connotes a weariness and an exhaustion, possibly even an oppressive heat that only late summer can bring. Cows suggests a rural area, and highway rest stop suggests a place that is less than savory or sanitary. This is not a place that's designed for comfort, but merely to serve basic needs. It's toilets, vending machines, maybe picnic benches, a water fountain, and if you're lucky, a church group giving away free coffee with pamphlets. Every image in the poem is thick and heavy and humid and overwhelming. Even the cows are struggling, trying just to swat away all of this with their tails. One way we can think about Tori Owase in haiku is a careful selection of words. The English language has synonyms for um, certain verbs or certain nouns, even basic things like colors or common verbs. One of the major debates in the prose community is whether or not writers should use dialogue enhancing verbs or dialogue tags, tags as opposed to said uh, or uh, wrote only as invisible words. If Tori Owase is a careful selection to enhance things for congruous harmony, then certainly choosing the right language, the right verb, such as swat, um, or the right adjective or adverb to enhance the overall mood of the poem is as important as picking the right images for the content. Let's uh, whip up some broader prompts. We've, we've looked at a few seed poems, but let's look at some broader prompts for you uh, viewers and poets to work from. Prompt number one is a condensed version of what we've been doing without a basic seed form or structure. Start with a Kigo. Decide what mood you want to evoke from that Kigo. List three to five sights, sounds, smells, touches, tastes um, that also evoke or enhance that mood then combine everything into a fragment phrase or um, context event uh, uh, formula and then um, build from there. Uh, prompt number two uh, starts with an external focal point. This can be a piece of art or music if you want to go ekphrastically. It could simply be a powerful memory or even a family photograph or something similar. The idea is that it's an emotional focal point. Come up with three to five sights, sounds, smells, tastes, touches that evoke these emotions as well and kind of relate to that focal point. Then find a Kigo to match. Again, something that everything that relates to that focal point. This is almost the reverse of prompt one. If prompt one starts with the Kigo as a fragment and builds from it, Prompt two starts with the phrase and builds from that. Either way, how do the images and emotions evoked enhance each other, even if they come from different places and different points of view? This next prompt really comes from an idea I've been toying with for a horiku essay about connotation in poetry and haiku but I think it could easily work for non-genre poems as well. Start with the Kigo, then focusing on the mood. Really think of adjectives and adverbs and verbs that could imply or enhance that mood. 
I know this is a twist on the way folks have been taught to write and approach haiku, and most of the drafts from this experiment will fail. Please know that if you try this and it flops, you're not alone. This is an experiment. This is practice. This is going to generate a lot of failed drafts, but it's something to try and build from and practice. Also, I want folks to consider digging into a thesaurus or a dictionary with this uh, prompt and learning the breadth of the language. I think that often with haiku, we tend to put ourselves in a rut and return to the same words, the same language, the same phrases, same image combinations. We do this as a community. We do this as individual poets. Studying books of words might spark some neurons and travel our thoughts down some different pathways. Now, I'm not advocating uh, using weird or obscure language or, uh, or uh, bizarre words, uh, simply words that we may have forgotten ourselves um, or words that readers might find unique, um, uncommon, or surprising. Again, make careful choices with the purpose of enhancing the overall mood or tone of the poem as dictated by the Kigo and the vertical axis of that Kigo. This last prompt is another kind of experimental approach. So if it comes across as a little funky or if they don't seem to be working, again, this is probably not your fault. It could be that the experiment simply doesn't do what I think it should. And if you have questions, absolutely hit me up on Twitter or Facebook, and I might be able to answer and walk you through a little more. And Patricia can guide you to me if you need. Um, however, I want to think about the idea of an implied portrait one made of images that deeply connote or resonate with the author and other people that might have known the individual in question, but that may or may not imply a person automatically for a reader that doesn't know that person. Um, but do evoke the emotions of that person or possibly what they represent for the author in the reader. So, Focusing on a person for whom the author has a deep emotional connection, list 10 to 20 images, all related to the senses about the person that evoke those emotions. Consider things like scents they would wear, how they smell due to work or hobbies. Consider things like foods they enjoyed or activities they like to do. Even things like annoying habits might be appropriate here if there are sensory images associated with them. Then paint a portrait of that person using a Kigo and one or two of these images in a fragment phrase or location context uh, style haiku. I'm sorry, context moment style haiku. Again, Leaning into these organizational tools will help, especially when trying to make choices for Tori Awase. All right, this is Luna. She's one of the head editors at Cuttlefish Book and pretty much runs the whole damn place. We thought Poetry P viewers might like a behind the scenes of our process here at Cuttlefish Books. So if you want to catch our attention and have us take your haiku seriously, you have to impress her. Uh, she is an ancient and divine being that likes uh, freeze-dried fish, any ball-shaped toys, and sacred offerings of rare haiku textbooks and cold hard cash on her altar. So if she says you folks can do this, I have absolutely no doubt in my mind that you've got this. A couple final thoughts on Tori Awase. One, remember this is a basic tool for poets and one that can be used in a variety of ways. Poets can absolutely focus on primary and contrasting images uh, that seem distant re distantly related and say it's Tori Awase, but that's only one way to use this tool. 
what we're trying to get off after in this presentation and trying to get across is the other ways Tori Owase can work, especially on the other end of the contrast versus joining spectrum. Consider things like enhancement and harmony, things working together. I really think those are great words that connote the choices one has to consider and the directions uh, one can travel um, when uh, making decisions about their haiku. But how those choices are organized and put together in the poem itself and on the paper or on the screen is as important as well. Poets should lean into the core haiku structures, fragment phrase, context event, link and shift or pivot, depending on how you've been taught it. Um, to craft their haiku, avoid list effect, and avoid merely using description or repetition to enhance the core image or kigo or emotion. Practice with the half dozen plus examples and prompts in this presentation. Try each one a few times, see, like, see what drafts you like best, and then polish them until they shine. Send them to Patricia, Remember, our goal is universal harmony and world peace. And at this point, if Luna, look at her face, look at her, look right there at the face on the screen. If she says you can do it, you kind of have to do it, right? Look at those eyes. Look right there. Look at the eyes. No options. Go forth and write. Well, I don't know about you, but I had my notebook at the ready throughout that presentation. My head was just sparking with ideas and I had to write them down because at my age, they get lost very quickly. I will remember to do what Joshua said and utilize my thesaurus a little bit more than I do, although I do use it. If you don't have a physical one, there is a website you can use and I'll put the link on the show notes. And while you're on the show notes, you'll find the prompts that Joshua spoke about. Just to remind you, there are four to choose from. And he was so right when he said, try things. Try new things and don't be afraid to fail. Often my failures become some of my more successful poems, as long as I work at them. Oh, and did you notice Joshua was talking about the vertical axis? If you don't know what that means, he did another workshop for us on that very subject. There will be a link in the show notes. And if that wasn't enough from Joshua, there will also be another little prezi from him in the show notes. Something you can print off and keep. Some translations of Busson, which are going to be very useful later in the year. And remember those little jobs I set you. Make sure you're on the mailing list. Sign up on the website. Leave a review for us wherever you get your podcasts or a comment on YouTube. And if you can, a donation or join up as a member and buy me a coffee. Well, with that, I thank you for joining us today. If you have questions and you'd like to send them to Joshua but don't have his contacts, I'll put his Instagram and Twitter links in the show notes. But you can always send me an email and I'll forward it on. Do join us next week for more short form poetry. But until then, keep writing. And if you think there's something missing from the show notes, just whisk me over an email. Ciao.